Thank you, Carib Trans. I hope we haven't lost the uh, live streaming audience. <laughs> hope you didn't get my jokes. Okay, so tonight's scientist is sponsored by Queens. Queens Hotel, located in beautiful Troy Hill, with tremendous views, great restaurant. That's where we'll be on Sunday night. They sponsored generously our scientists for this evening. Uh, our program is not possible without Prince Bernard Culture Funds in the Caribbean and public entity SABA, which is our government. We have more than 50 sponsors. We ask that everyone gives a hi-fi and a thank you when you recognize a logo and you go to their restaurant or bar or uh, hotel and say, hey, thanks for sponsoring See and Learn. Uh, we talked while we were waiting about the Isle Explorer uh, platform. If you have your phone out, you can uh, take a picture of the QR code and use it later, and they would really appreciate getting some feedback on the soft launch of this new app. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, these are the raffle prizes, which I think we've uh, covered pretty well. But for our home audience, check out the website, check out our social media. There's fantastic prizes. And for our live streaming audience, we can take uh, money if you uh, email us, call us. You can buy raffle tickets. You do not have to be present to enter. We actually had a longtime great customer buy $200 worth yesterday. Uh, upcoming events, you can see it on our website. We're going to push forward a little bit so we can get started with tonight's event. We still have space on tomorrow's field project, and don't miss Sunday's presentation. Uh, if you participate in a field project, these are attractive t-shirts and tank tops that are made with recycled materials. And raise your hand if you're drinking a cloud top. This is the beer for the 20th anniversary that was sponsored by scientist Erica Moulton and these companies, Bastet Brewing out of Tampa, made our beer uh, inspired by Saba Spice and uh, the other companies you see on there, including our own Hassle Free, uh, Geo Aqua Watch, and Center for Ocean or Open Exploration. So for the moment, everyone has been waiting for and get me off the stage. Uh, tonight, Saba is home to several endemic species, including the Saba black iguana. Unfortunately, Saba is also now home to the green iguana, an invasive spe species. So what is, the relationship with, uh, what is the relationship between these species? Well, that's what we're going to find out tonight. Natalie Duporge is a French wildlife zoologist with a dual professional background combining ex situ and in situ conservation skills. Based in Martinique, she's focused on conservation projects for Iguana delicatissima, we can call it delicatessen, for the last five years, and she had the pleasure to join the IUCN Iguana Specialist Group in 2021. Innovative in the tools she uses, cameras, camera traps, and <laughs> endoscopy, sorry, <laughs> IR imaging, photo identification, etc. She has long been active in the French West Indies National Action Plans and has a thorough knowledge of the region and its stakeholders. Test your spot the difference skills to distinguish between native, invasive, and hybrid iguanas. So please welcome Sharp Eyed Natalie as your guide tonight. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Sorry about the technical issue. Uh, I'm very happy to be there. Uh, as Lynn said, I'm Natalie. Uh, I'm French, so I may have may sometimes some trouble with my English, but we'll do manage. And I'm happy to be there uh, tonight to introduce you to the different issues we can encounter in iguana conservation, especially about the Saban iguana and the new and upcoming situation with the arrival of some green iguana on your island and how do we scientists and stakeholders do to mitigate this problem of in invasion in the Caribbean islands. So first let's come to basics. Uh, what's an iguana? Um, it's no dinosaur, it's no amphibian, it's the same family as crocodiles, tortoise, snakes, 
they are reptiles. So we can uh, recognize them thanks to your, their scales. And it's supposed that they will have uh, some uh, properties and abilities we will talk about later. Those animals, they are most of the time terrestrial and they are diurnal. They need to do their stuff during the day because those animals are cold, like cold blooded. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as they don't produce their own eat, so they need the sun to eat them and they eat the sun to get energy to do everything they need to. So iguana, you can see there is lots of different species of iguana in the world, including the black seven iguana. They all have the same sort of shape, but you can see lots of different colors, patterns, even sizes. So all the iguanas are a tropical animal. They come from this own region on the planet, except for the Fiji island, which is a bit far away. Um, and uh, they are uh, not found anywhere else in the world. So it's an information that is very important to deal with their, as if they're in any need to, co to protect them or not. So let's say a word about the iguana life cycle. So those animals, they need to accomplish the life cycle to stay and uh, to, be, uh, to have generation after generation. So first we do have some adults. They will mate. And after that, as they are reptiles, the iguanas are laying eggs in sort of sandy soil. So most of the time, Above the different species, they lay between 15 to 30 eggs. For the seven iguana, it's almost or every time around 15. But some other species, like the green iguana, some lineage of the green iguana can lay uh, up to 60 eggs at, at a time. And most of the time, they will do that once, once a year. But in some places where there is something to eat all year long, the female will have enough energy to lay twice a year. So it means that they can reproduce a lot quite very fast. Uh, after two months is in the soil, the eggs will hatch. And so we will have those cute little, uh, OK, I love iguanas, so I, I feel they are cute. <laughs> those cute hatchlings. And they will go out of the eggs. And as soon as they are outside, they are tiny, they are small, so they can encounter lots of predators that can eat them. So they need to hide directly in the nearest bushes or trees to be safe. And they start eating because iguanas, yes, they spend lots of time eating and the other time bathing, sand bathing, and the rest of time mating. So they will eat and eat so they can grow up going to the uh, sub-adult phase. And as soon as they are um, big enough, because it's not a problem of aging to become an adult, but a problem of size. As soon as they reach this, the recommended size, the needed one for their biology to allow them to have eggs and for the male to allow them to uh, beat all the men or the uh, male iguanas to access to the female, they become reproducible and they become adults. And so here we have the whole cycle of their life. So what's the role of the iguanas in our ecosystem? So as we said previously, on the biology level, they are ectothermic. They don't produce their own heat as mammals do. So they need to sunbath to get enough energy, most of the time for the digestion of what they are eating and for uh, moving and things like that. They sort of have the same temperature as their environment. So they love to lay on big rocks that have been eaten by the sun or get this uh, eat from all over themselves. So uh, they do, due to that, they act most of the time during the day and during the night, they will find a place that they feel safe. So lots of time they are grow, um, climbing in trees like the little ones, but gr uh, growing up, most of the time they start to dig burrows and they slept in burrows all night long. So they are herbivorous, so it means like that iguanas are not really dangerous. They won't bite you because they are angry or things like that. 
they eat some leaves, fruits, flowers, uh, anything they can find that it looks like from far or from close to a vegetable. Um, we can have some iguanas that can be some opportunistic iguanas because as they need energy to function, they are a champion in sparing energy. So between going in the trees to get some leaves and going, it, going sorry, in that bin just around them with some things to eat, they will go in the bin. So they can eat french fries, chicken, or anything that is leftovers. And they are terrestrial and arboreal. Uh, so, regarding their ecosystem place and role, uh, those iguanas, they finally are considered grazing prey for lots of animals. Most of the time they are just prey when they are juveniles because they are tiny enough so that uh, other animals can catch them. As soon as they grew and get adult size, it's very difficult for them to be catched, even by human. Uh, the thing is that in the original region of uh, the common iguana, which is uh, most of the time South America, there is larger predators like jaguars, big monkeys, and so all these predators also eat adults. But on our tiny island, only the little ones can be catched by cats, dogs, chicken or birds of prey, and even by rats. Rats uh, most of the time are destructing the nest because they eat the eggs directly. So it can be a real problem when you are trying to protect a species that we, we, you have rats on your nesting sites. And so it's very important to have this in mind. So those animals, as you can see, they eat leaves, flowers, and fruits. So they are considered sort of natural gardeners for the landscape, keeping uh, the vegetation in shape. And they also are a good uh, seed spreaders because as they eat the fruits, they will uh, travel a little bit, and so with the poop they, uh, they go outside, the seeds will be uh, unable to grow faster and, uh, and they can spread the seeds at the different places they go. So some people can don't understand why uh, iguanas have their place in the ecosystem, but they do. <laughs> okay, I'm fond of iguanas. I've already said that. So what about Saba black iguana? Your beautiful marvelous <laughs> iguana uh, has this uh, special uh, shape and color. So this color is a sort of melanistic form of the common iguana. And we will talk in the next slides about this question. Is it um, just a melanic form or is it a separate species of the common iguana? They are endemic to Saba and Montserrat. That means that it seems that we don't find them anywhere else in the world. And they start to be threatened uh, by different uh, type of threats. We will talk about that. So here is a map of your island with the different um, most iguana sightings that has been done by my friend Thijs van der Berg, which is, uh, who is working a lot on this species. Okay. When you look at the map, you can see that lots of iguanas are seen around roads. And that's pretty normal because mm, there is not so many people uh, going in the places where is, there is no roads or uh, houses. So it's um, often the time when we are studying species that we first have lots of sightings around where we have activities. So for those who will be interested tomorrow uh, to join for a little hike to try to see them, we have uh, postponed the departure because iguanas need sun to move and to do their activities. So at eight in the morning, it's a good uh, hour for humans, but it's not a good hour for uh, iguanas. So we postponed it a little bit later, around 10. And I think uh, if Lynn, you're uh, okay about, with that, we'll go on this, uh, around this place, yes. Uh, and I think it's a good spot to try to see some iguanas, take pictures, and uh, have a chat and discussion about them. Yeah, so considering the question of do we have to consider the black seven iguana as a own, uh, uh, our own species or only a subspecies, we do have some work that have been done the last three years about the genetic side of this, uh, as because, um, okay, phenotypically, when you look at the iguana, uh, a green iguana and a saba iguana really look the same, except for the color and some sign we will talk about, and except for the pattern on the body. 
But when you deepen the question at the genetic level, scientists has quite recently isolated dif different lineage in the common iguana population with a French Guiana um, major group of iguana in this population coming out of uh, South America. Uh, and um, a second group with St. Lucia and Grenadine of iguana that looks like the common iguana and the Saba iguana but are genetically different on the mi microsatellite level. And then the Montserrat and Sabat uh, iguana isolated from the two previous. And uh, there are scientists and doing lots of great things about genetics. They also look about the mitochondrial ADN, uh, DNA, sorry, of those species. And it's thought as the same, the three groups with the common iguana iguana, the St. Lucia granadine iguana insularis. And so we are arguing just right now this the decision is not made, but we will. Uh, we have proposed to name the iguana of Saba, iguana melanoderma, as a, his own species, different from the two other groups. So, like, with those results, you can see that science is still ongoing, and we don't have all the keys and clues to make a decision at at this time. So, when you look at them, here you have pictures of the Saba iguana and pictures of green iguana. Uh, I can understand that don't uh, that uh, people that aren't iguana specialists think they are all the same, <laughs> but when you look at it closely, we can uh, see some differences. Uh, the main difference is the color, of course, because it's a melanic form. So you can see this one is a young uh, Saba iguana. This one is an adult one, really more aged. Uh, the First of all thing we spot when we see them is the black spot they have between the high and the tympanum. Uh, I'll bring this with me. Do, 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 do. So on the uh, anatomy of iguana, here is the eye, here is what we call uh, the subtempanic scale, and here, here is the ear of the iguana. They don't have external ear, they only have a tympanum. So the spot, the black zone, is really between the eye and the tympanum. And as they go older, the black just spans uh, everywhere on the body. And on those ones that are common iguana, uh, pictures taken in Martinique, you can see that even if there are some black somewhere, it doesn't look the same. And most of the, um, most of the green iguana also wear some sort of a horn on the nose that seven iguana never have. So we do have some clues when we look at them uh, from the outside uh, to um, forecast if they are uh, pure seven iguana or hybrids or uh, even uh, green iguanas. So here I, disp uh, I spent some uh, pictures of iguana. Um, maybe we can try a little quiz. <laughs> Mm, so the big picture in, uh, in the middle, what do you think it is? Common iguana or Saban iguana? Yeah, yes, Saba, because of the, yes, the nice uh, black spot, really well see there. Um, let's see this one with the orange glove. It's a bit tricky. <laughs> no. <laughs> this one is the common iguana uh, from Martinique and the um, black things, it's just dirt. It's not, oh. yes, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, this one in the middle at the back. Saber, yes, it's Saber. Uh, the green one, yes, this one is Saber. The other up, green iguana. And you can see the horn on the nose for this one. And up there. Yes, an aging, really a aging Seba Iguana, of course. And we have those two little ones. So, this one? Yeah, this one is Seba, thanks to the black spot that is starting. And this pattern on the body that the green iguana doesn't have. So, you see, it's not that good. But sometimes it can be a bit tricky, and so that's why we need some genetic tool to really know what uh, uh, we are facing. So, yeah. yeah. There? 
It's a bag, yes. When we catch them, we put them in some bags dedicated for iguanas, and it's really easy to carry them that, that way. Yeah. They feel really comfortable and uh, just calm down, and they can breathe. It's cotton bags, and it's really effective. Yeah. So the question is, we do have some beautiful black iguanas on Saba, but why do we need to protect them? Why are we talking about conservation about them? So this species is some sort of flagship species for Saba of this, um, yes, because they are a, a representative of this unique ecosystem. They are a unique melanistic iguana, Saba and Montserrat, but no, nowhere else in the world we have iguanas that look like this. They are endemic. They are the largest native vertebrate of the island, so if we let them disappear, there will not be any largest, uh, that large vertebrate on the island. They are gardeners, harvesters of this beautiful landscape and seed spreaders, so they really participate at the maintenance of uh, the ecosystem. And also they are our biodiversity heritage for the future generations. So all those um, topics are very important and that's why we are a very, um, um, sorry, uh, it's very important for us to try to protect them and let, not let them disappear. Why will they disappear anyway? Is there any threats that can um, uh, drive them to extinction? Yes, there is. So iguanas uh, all around the world have uh, faced lots of phases of historic hunting. It's uh, meat that seems like, pe like people are liking. And uh, previously, they were just like bushmeat. People don't have uh, animals to grow to eat, so they just take the iguanas from nature, and that was nice because there was not so many people. So it was not a real problem, but to date, it's, it can be because they have uh, encountered lots of hunting when the Caribbean islands were colonized. They uh, are also facing today the deterioration of their habitat uh, caused to different problems like roaming livestock, like roads that goes more and more uh, in the nature, or land that we are using for uh, human activities, so there is less land, for, less habitat for these animals. They also uh, can encounter uh, some, some issues, issues with food competition. competition. If there is lots of roaming livestock, livestock are everywhere, they will eat every new leaves, and the iguanas won't find any food resources anymore. The same for some other invasive uh, species. The juveniles, we, can, we have seen that they are really tiny and they are the only phase of the species that can be really uh, affected by uh, too many predators. So if there are feral cats or feral animals that prey on them, it can be a real problem for the species and lead them to extinction. It's the case in different islands. And the most problem, the major one, that we encounter in the different Caribbean islands and that is emerging in Savannah is the hybridization with the, the invasive common or green iguana. So for all these reasons and the previous one, um, this species is a real part of the balance of Sabah ecosystem and if they disappeared, uh, this will break this balance and some other problems can uh, be seen and new to the ecosystem. So why are we so concerned about the fact that green iguanas can arrive and have already arrived on Saba Island? This species is um, naturally present in South America and Central America. And we have seen in all over the lesser until that they have been um, coming inside the different islands at different times and from different ways. Um, the historical invasive introduction was a bit long ago, but not that far. And most of the time, the, the threat is due to human activity or transportation. They can just climb in a boat from anywhere and then go off this boat at the arrival destination. And also, uh, because we are in a region that encounters lots of climate problems like hurricanes, and it's easy for an iguana to stay on a branch after a storm or a hurricane, and this uh, branch is just um, floating on the sea and arriving at the, the, the
the next island and the iguana jump off the branch and okay, is in a new island and nobody noticed. So due to that, we have uh, previously talked about that, that some different genetic lineage start to appear in our islands. And uh, the, this is due to the fact that this green iguana can uh, interbreed with the native local iguanas of the different islands. So this iguana uh, is uh, unable to lay to 30 to 60 eggs per liter, so it's far way more than other native species, due to the fact that it's coming out from a continent and encountering more predators. This uh, um, species of iguana is, um, has this capacity to lay more eggs to have more survival rates. Uh, than uh, other native species on Little Island without predators that, that uh, face uh, not those problems of survival rate. So regular climatic events, we talked about that. They most of the time spread along the coast because it's easy for them to find sun there, to find re food resources, and because uh, jumping into the sea is a very nice way for them to escape any threats, so, so they love uh, to stay on the coastal, but if there is no more place, there was about to grow population inside the islands. And the major uh, problem with this species is the hybridization risk. So just, uh, just uh, a few pictures of the Guadeloupe situation, the Martinique situation, and some uh, numbers from Grand Canyon, Grand Cayman, sorry and Guadeloupe and Martinique. And here you can see some pictures that were taken when we first saw in Martinique the first hybrids between common iguanas and our local native one called Delicatissima. And they have uh, different features that is really uh, telling us that those animals are interbred between the two species. So this hybridization problem is that those species are so close that when they interbreed, they have some infants, so that those infants are hybrids. But the problem is that not most of the time in nature, hybrids aren't able to breed again because you know when you uh, interbreed um, a horse and a donkey, the result is not able to breed because it's not natural. But these species, they are so close that when uh, hybrids, a first generation of hybrids is born, they can interbreed again with both native or invasive or also hybrids. And as the uh, green iguana coming out from a continent, his genes are very strong and very, uh, um, yes, very strong. So most of the time the hybrids just look like the green iguana and we, that's why we need genetic information to be really sure if there are hybrids or not. And we, to date we can also um, know if it's a first generation hybrid or a second or third generation. So it's, it let us know really important information to deal with them. So if you look at this uh, nice gym, you can see different results um, uh, about genetics between the different species of iguana we talked about. And normally, the Saba and Montserrat uh, iguana genetically are that far away from the others, but some of them already are, uh, the samples of some of them already show that hybridization is uh, running in Saba. So some of the animals that have been sampled has been uh, considered hybrids because of this. The problem with the green iguana is not only on the hybridization level, it's also ecological, sanitary, and economical for the different islands where they spread. On the ecological level, we've seen that they are laying lots of more eggs than the native species of iguana. That means that the population will grow so fast that in different places, the vegetation just can't keep growing. You can see here mangrove pictures taken after uh, the arrival of iguanas. They just settled down and they were so numerous that, that they eat every leaves and every new one so that mangroves start dying. And in St. Martin, after Irma, the same situation has been seen. There were tons of iguana, there is still. 
and the vegetation after the hurricane just can't go, uh, grew up again because of the iguanas eating, eating, eating every tiny little leaves that was coming out. So it's a real problem. So on the ecological side, we do have those both hybridization and overgrazing of because they are too numerous. On the center side, we do have some uh, research, uh, yes, ongoing also, because iguanas are uh, animals that are really. time our health carrier for very bad bacteria or microbiome that can be transmitted to other species like for delicatissima the green iguanas as bring bring in martinique and guadeloupe uh, a bacteria never been never seen before on this species and it lets the delicatissima to, de to death so it's not that good and most of the time as they love to stay on the coastal side and near the concrete and buildings that are very hot because they need this heat. They can also spend lots of time in dirty places with rats and so on. So we do have really uh, sanitary issues on, in these places. So that's why we recommend people not to eat them. Yep. Is that an injury on the metal roll, right? Yep. Yeah. And on the economical level, lots of island uh, to date uh, encounter really huge problems because as they are digging burrows and nests, if the population of iguana is overgoing, they start to destroy roads, they start to destroy even buildings because they dig too many burrows uh, below the buildings and so we have to deal with all this and it costs a lot. So all those invasive species have different uh, impacts that we consider the ecological, sanitary, and economical, and very important one. So, um, which options do we have to control this when we want to protect a species or deal with the impact we talked about? So, depending on the pressure of uh, the invasive species on the ecosystem we are in, the means available, the cost that will uh, be um, needed, and the objective, uh, we've seen that on the Caribbean islands, we have uh, three thought of control that have been set up depending on those situations. The first one is the Iguana Curl that the Cayman Island have been running. Uh, the other one can be removal on report, for example, from the French West Indies Island. And then considering the real need to, to protect uh, the native species, just conserving the native species on a remote islet so that you don't have any invasive uh, problem as, uh, as soon as you uh, ensure biosecurity on your islet. So the Grand Cayman option, uh, the population of green iguana on Grand Cayman was just crazy in numbers. So they started to survey the whole Grand Cayman Island to know what, about, what the population was. They surveyed it uh, every year and they started to have enough information to try to model the evolution of this population for the coming years. And so they said, okay, if we don't do anything, the whole island will just disappear under iguanas. So they decided, yes, really. So they decided to uh, uh, form and agree uh, 44 people to be unable to kill, catch and kill the iguanas. So within uh, three years, they just catch and kill 1.3 million of common iguana on the island. Uh, you can see there that they were catching lots of iguanas the first years and months. We have the lockdown, and then uh, we started to they started to catch less iguanas. So they will now arrive at a point that okay, there is not so many iguanas. So what and how do we do with the remaining ones? And we'll talk about that later. In the French West Indies, um, the situation was a bit different because we don't have such many iguanas all over the island, but lots of anyway. But the question has been raised because of the conserv conservation need for the Delicatissima iguana. So we decided with the French authorities to develop public outreach to um, uh, to, uh, to sensibilize people about the problem. 
Uh, we had to change the statuses of the different species, one to protect, one to decide what we can do with it. it. Uh, and, and then to so look about the way we will capture them and uh, what legal uh, framework do we need for that. So we write down a control plan for the family one a few years ago. And this, this plan has been implemented in Martinique, but not in every place. You can see that uh, on these four French territories, you see different dates, you see different... Uh, level of the control plan, no control plan, no control plan, under consideration, one control plan in action, different institutions, that's a real problem because our territories are scattered and our politicians are different and sometimes it's difficult, it's difficult to have all, everybody agree on the same topic. So, and the situation with the A1 as well is a bit different. So most of the time what we do is education, directed uh, to citizens and politics in every territories. Then we try to remove the iguanas when we can, so we do have some removal on report on different places and punctual regulation, but we do not have large-scale reg regulation or cull like in the Caymans. Why not? I'm not French authorities. And the main problem uh, for me is that we do not have any biosecurity done at uh, the entry port of the island, which is harbor or a a airports. So for me, it's the real problem. And I think on, on an island tiny um, like Saba, it's a real um, thing to think about. Every possible invasive species that can enter your tiny paradise, because it's paradise. So here is some numbers about uh, what we've done in Martinique and you can see that we only catch uh, 5,500 uh, common iguana in five years. So you can see that the result is far away different from the Cayman Island, but the problem was far away different too. So uh, I can't tell now if this is really useful or not, but it's not my role to know. So anyway. <laughs> I'm not French authorities, again. Uh, and the th third option we talked about was to decide to put your native iguana on a remote island to protect it uh, from the invasive one. So that's the Anguilla option they take. The thing is that on their mainland, there were only a few remaining native iguana, so they faced an increasing number of invasive red iguana coming with boats most of the time. But they were, it was still today too challenging to set biosecurity process on the harbor. So they decided five years ago. Yeah, to put them uh, put, to put every native iguana they can find on the mainland on a remote island, prickly pear east, so that there will be off end of the common green iguana coming. So they start to do that, they monitor the population, they added uh, external founders because Delicatissima is present on different islands. They take some Delicatissima from Dominica so that they uh, entered new genetic, new blood in the population. And this population is doing quite well and they are breeding since a few years with uh, new hatchlings and so on. And so on the main island, they still undergo uh, looking for iguanas. It's they just um, do some genetics to be sure that they are not hybrids. And if they are pure delicta, they put it on the island. And if it's hybrids or green iguana, and when it's catch, it's a kill and everything is okay. So, so everything is okay. Let's cross the fingers. So. All of this to finalize, to focus on the problem of invasive species. These invasive species, they are considered the major factor of the potential extinction of lots of animals. So we consider 30% of threatened bird species and six, uh, 15 are, uh, of plant species encountered uh, invasive uh, species problems. And we consider that two of a third of species extinction are related from far or close to the presence and the development of invasive species on new um, places. 
The thing is that our Caribbean islands are particularly sensitive to that because of the fact that we are home of a very rich biodiversity. We are outspot of it. So it's uh, very important to be aware of that and to forecast it before it's too late. Yes, it's easy to understand that uh, invasive species problem on islands is way far more, it's way, yes, it's very more uh, difficult, uh, okay, impacted, I don't know, uh, than in continents because we are a uh, closed, closed ecosystem and we do need to have uh, links with other islands and those links, they are very difficult to manage and real doors to entry of um, invasive species. So for example, the small Indian mangoes has been killed, lots of reptiles, but uh, it's not all, only an animal problem. As you can see that the coral creeper is also a problem and it's only a plant and it causes dam damages also. So we have to look about every type of the animal rain anyway. So the challenge is for the different um, island of the Caribbean regarding especially the green iguana pressure is that we all are working on new objective to work on that you can see the word biosecurity for lots of them uh, in Martinique we are trying to deal with the tools we have today but biosecurity will probably be the next one in Caymans as we've seen they are catching less iguanas uh, per year to date because uh, they have killed a lot of them and that's pretty nice. So now they need to find bridging action to preserve the effort that have been done and not to let the population growing back again. So it will probably uh, lead them to sh have a shift on the way they are dealing with green iguanas. On Anguilla and on Saba, so we keep assessing the genetic unicity of the Saba and iguana as we said before because we need to be sure that we can consider it a dedicated species. So for what is to come, for example, in Guadeloupe, we are trying to um, train dogs to detect iguana, to ease the uh, finding of nests, to ease the finding of uh, green iguanas in the different facilities. And it will be a great tool for uh, implementing, for example, biosecurity process on boats and uh, arbors and things like that. On Stasia, they have uh, they are uh, dealing with funding to strengthen uh, hybrid early detection and uh, they will probably do it uh, with an international cooperation level with experts from different islands and that would be great. So on Caymans, funding is also necessary. Anguilla is undergoing some sort of a mainland island project. They have their remote islet with delicate stima, but as we said, you can't only put all your eggs in the same basket. So they were, are trying to set a mainland island, like an island but on the mainland, with a special fence to be sure that invasive species, iguanas, rats, feral cats, can't enter this land they are trying to protect. And so they can, will can be able to put some delicatissima and other protected species in this mainland island. So it's a great project to come. So within the French West Indies, we are working with the Ministry of, with, of Environment to get more funding for uh, invasive species management and control. And on Saba, uh, we, you have a currently project undergoing for uh, uh, this year and next year to, okay, to try to catch every non-native iguana that can be seen on the island on two dedicated places where some of them have been seen. So, that's Thais working on it. So to conclude, I would say that when we are dealing between conservation and invasion, we should have all in mind that islands are sensitive ecosystem because of their size and specificity, that the natural balance rely on dedicated native species because they are just the great uh, equilibrium between what the ecosystem can uh, offer to them and what they can consume and if you have an invasive species coming inside everything just break down 
and break the balance. And so healthy ecosystem, they just can't support those invasive species coming out from larger space uh, with larger capacity of reproducing and colonizing. So efficient conservation really requires operational management of this sort of threats. All of them sort of showed here with the pictures. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, just ask. Martin is, I'd say that neither, yep, yep. So the question was, on St. Martin, are the Dutch side cooperating with the French side for managing the iguana problem? I would say that neither the Dutch and neither the French side are dealing with the problem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and is that because they're not supporting it or no one is asking the government? I don't know. The question was, is it because there nobody supported it or because? Like no one asked the government. Okay. Uh, no, the problem is that in St. Martin, there is no more native iguana to protect. So I do think that the ecological um, issue, which is probably mobilizing politicians and other authorities in other territories, doesn't exist in St. Martin. The, there is the only the economical issue and probably a little bit sanitary issue and the politician there they don't they are not aware of that and they don't take it in consideration today maybe tomorrow so do you feel the answer in St Martin is to kill all the iguanas the problem with the iguana in St Martin is oh yes the question uh, so do you, do we think that killing all the iguana in St Martin in St Martin is the solution so I'd say that probably managing this population will be a first step. There are so many iguanas, they are reproducing so fast in places that we can't, can't reach the nest or so on. When you catch iguanas, you just catch them one by one. So it takes lots of time and lots of money to send people to catch them. So it's too late to dream to eradicate iguanas out of St. Martin, it's sure but probably trying to manage the population so that they can't overgrow and overgrow, probably it will be a great idea because um, lots of people are encountering problems with iguanas uh, as they are producing vegetables and things like that. And so they lost lots of their production due to iguanas and monkeys. But uh, so yes, I think that neither authorities on both sides can no longer ignore it, the problem. The question, the remark was that in uh, other countries, sometimes they pay people to uh, catch the uh, problematic animal and they are reward for bringing them to the authorities. That was the um, Cayman solution, for example. Uh, it can work. The problem is that in lots of our Caribbean islands, we do have native iguanas. So it's very difficult to allow people to catch iguanas or anything else. Uh, because you can't be sure that they don't kill the one you want to protect. So it's very, yes, uh, very problematic. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Okay, I have a non very, non very popular question. I love all animals that iguanas and good iguanas. So all the talks about killing bad iguanas to me brought me the wrong way. So the remark was that um, some people have this sensitivity of why, who we are to decide which iguana should live or not. And I agree with that anyway. Uh, all those animals are 
animal beings. So the problem is that those iguanas, most of the time, they arrive here due to human activity. They are brought by humans in places that there are no predators and mm, they don't fit the ecosystem they arrive in. So if we let everything go, we can consider its evolution. Um, I have not the answer, and I think m that nobody has it today, but we are facing uh, the breakdown of the ecosystem thanks to those invasive animals, and so we have to do something for the all remaining animals um, previously living in this e ecosystem. So it's not easy. that it's true that those animals can be considered as a food source as soon as we catch them and kill them and maybe we can use them. The problem is that in lots of places we have sanitary issues with those animals so we can't allow people to eat them by themselves and we do have also um, problems with establishing a real integrated way to deal with those corpses produced and are they produced all year long? So is it economically viable to have uh, meat from iguanas all year? And the uh, last thing, is, and the last thing is that um, oh, I lost it. Sorry, and. Uh, sorry, I can't remember. I, I had another thing to, to say, but it goes away. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yeah. What is the length of incubation period for the eggs? Oh, yeah. So what is the incubation period for the eggs of iguana? So most of the time, the female, they grew the eggs inside the body for something between three weeks and a month. And after they lay the eggs, they will hatch within the two months. So it's quite fast. And as they are um, cold-blooded, they really need lots of energy to lay their eggs. So in their original region with the rainy season, we do have only one reproduction a year. But in tiny uh, little island like ours, we do have, okay, rainy season, but we do have also lots of food available every year long with all the productions, all the trash bins and things like that. So we do uh, observe right now in French West Indies that they will probably reproduce twice a year. So, not that good. Yep. Yeah. So the question is, what happens if the iguana population grow? So, um, for, you mean the green iguana or like the native one? The native one. So the native population, you can see that from ages, the, pop, the island of Saba is not overcrowded by black iguanas. It's because they just are at the right balance. They just produce enough offspring a year, and there is uh, enough predators for our, the juveniles, and so the population is just stable over uh, all the years from ages. And if there is, I don't think that they really can shift to be overgrowing. The problem will probably be on the other side. They will probably have difficulties to keep growing. Yeah. 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 So the question is, uh, is there any places that we have uh, uh, I'd say ex situ breeding program, and I remember what was my uh, third ID for the fact of meat. We don't, um, in French territories anyway, we don't want uh, to produce meat from iguana because we are afraid that people will start growing them in their garden and rest uh, have them escape. So, um, yeah. And so for the ex situ breeding, yes, there is some program about conservation in zoos or uh, breeders. Uh, for the native species, and that's a real good solution to have them, you know, uh, protected. In case they disappear, we can start again with those founders. So 
it exists for some of uh, the species of iguana we saw in the first pictures, yes. A delicate smell, for example, and some rock iguanas too. Yeah, and caiman too. I guess I have a question. Are there any uh, near-term uh, predictions of uh, climate change effects on population dynamics or hybridization risks? Or uh, I think that uh, we do have. Oh, the question is: uh, Is there any forecast about the climate change problem on iguana conservation? Yeah. So I think we do have lots of uh, information about the, all this climate ch change thing, and I'm afraid that on iguana conservation we have not enough data today to know in which way it can uh, affect them really. So this is problematic issues that we are working on for sure, but uh, will probably develop in the coming years. Yeah. Thank you for everything. <laughs>